Okay. I, th <laughs> I thought we were going with plan B, but we're actually going with plan C. Okay. <laughs> um, good morning. At this time, let us remember our colleagues and friends who have passed away this past year. Good morning. Always tough to come up after that, but um, <clears throat> great that the audio is working. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Sue Quaggan. I'm ASN past president and was privileged to serve as this year's chair of the ASN Awards Selection Committee. I am now thrilled to present this year's ASN Mid-Career Award recipients. They represent the very best of everything we do in the kidney community, from research to education to clinical care to leadership to mentorship. I'm going to ask each of the recipients uh, to step forward when their name is called. And for the, the tough part, I'm going to ask all of you to hold your applause until all of the names have been announced. And I know that's really, really difficult. 
Dr. Anna Bergner, Distinguished Educator Award. Dr. Thomas Carroll, Distinguished Researcher Award. Dr. Jason Cobb, Distinguished Educator Award. Dr. Ian DeBoer, Distinguished Researcher Award. Dr. Michael Hung, Distinguished Clinical Service Award. Dr. Kanar Javari, Distinguished Leader Award. Dr. Ann O'Hare, Distinguished Mentor Award. Dr. Jeff Pearl, Distinguished Leader Award. Dr. Connie Ree, Distinguished Mentor Award. And Dr. Eric Wallace, Distinguished Clinical Service Award. Please join me in celebrating these amazing individuals. Congratulations. Glad to see this mic is working now. I wouldn't want to struggle up here. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our final day of Kidney Week, and I hope that you have all enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, thank you so much for coming. As you know, my name is Mark Perizal. I'm one of the Kidney Week co-chairs and had the extreme pleasure to work with my partner as co-chair, Dr. Diane McKay. It has really been great to come together today uh, as a kidney community throughout this week in Philadelphia. And I'm really, really honored and thrilled to, to introduce um, our speaker today. Today's state of our lecture will be delivered by Mr. Bill McKibben. His topic is Too Hot, Human Bodies and Inhuman Temperatures. He is a contributing writer for the New Yorker and a founder of Third Act, which, is, which organizes people over the age of 60 to work on climate and racial justice. He founded the first global grassroots climate campaign called 350.org and serves as a Schumann Distinguished Professor in Residence at Middlebury College in Vermont. 
There's so many things I could say about him, but I'm going to be limited because I really want to get to hear his, him speak this morning. In 2014, Mr. McKibben was awarded the Wright Livelihood Prize. Um, you know, honestly, sometimes this is called the Alternative Nobel. He was uh, given this in the Swedish Parliament. He also won the Gandhi Peace Prize and has honorary degrees from 19 colleges and universities. He's written over a dozen books about the environment, including his first, which was The End of Nature, published in 1989, and his latest book, The Flag, The Cross, and The Station Wagon. A graying American looks back at his suburban boyhood and wonders what the hell happened. Welcome, Mr. McKibben. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, and what a pleasure to be here. I was, frankly, a tiny bit worried that I might be intimidated to be the sole non-nephrologist in a aircraft carrier-sized room full of nephrologists. Um, but I'm a pretty quick study, and I've been looking at all the giant billboards for uh, new pharmaceuticals all over the place, so I think I'm pretty much ready to prescribe. Um, <laughs> I, I, when I checked in at the hotel yesterday, the very nice young woman behind the counter said, are you here for the kidney meeting? And I said, yes, I am. And she immediately said, I have a pain in my shoulder blade. Do you think that could be connected to the kidneys somehow? And I thought for a minute, what would, a, what would be the responsible thing to do here? Um, you know, and I said, well, I think you should go see your doctor, but in the meantime, drinking more water couldn't hurt, you know. So I, I, it really was good to get to feel like a nephrologist for a little while. I'm here mostly, I think, because I wrote an article for The New Yorker this summer about research that my friend David Goldfarb and some of his colleagues had been doing about the relationship between heat and kidney disease. I think it was probably uh, the only known overlap between those two noble periodicals, The New Yorker and uh, uh, current opinions in nephrology and hypertension. Um, um, uh, but it was really, really useful for me to get to focus for once on the smallest as opposed to the largest manifestations of this gravest dilemma that humans have ever wandered into. I'm gonna begin by apologizing a little bit for my low-tech approach. I know that you all have been looking at slides all week, and that's pretty much why I'm not gonna show you any. Um, I want this to... I want this to feel just a little bit different and a little bit stark and perhaps a little unsettling. But if you need to think of it as a, think of it as a new technology virtual PowerPoint, if I'm doing it right, the pictures will appear in your head as I speak. My work since I was in my 20s has been on this question of what we now call climate change. When I wrote the first book about it back in 1989, it was still the greenhouse effect. But we understood it pretty thoroughly back in 1989. Scientists by then were reaching a broad and deep consensus on this fairly complex problem in chemistry and physics. What they told us then is if we didn't curtail the use of coal and gas and oil, then the accumulating carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere would raise the temperature dramatically. We did not curtail the use of coal or gas or oil. Human beings have produced more carbon dioxide since 1989 than in all of human history before. And as a result, we're now dealing with precisely what those scientists told us we would be dealing with. Uh, and indeed, 2023 was, I think, the year that I was imagining back in 1989. This has been a truly remarkable year in the history of the Earth. Uh, 
Beginning in January or February, temperatures be already obviously trending higher began to trend well above that line. And by the middle of the year, by June, which is the warmest part of the year um, always anyway, scientists were telling us that the anomaly uh, between past performance and current temperatures was higher than they'd ever seen it. Indeed, there were a series of days in June and early July that they reckoned were the hottest days, globally average, that we've ever measured on this planet. Those measurements with thermometers go back about 200 years, but scientists are good at figuring out proxy uh, uh, measurements, tree rings, uh, ice cores. They were able to say with real firmness that temperatures we've seen this year are the hottest we've seen on this planet in at least 125,000 years. Think about that for a moment. Our understanding of how everything works on this planet comes from an earlier and cooler Earth than we're now experiencing. That rise in temperature is obviously affecting systems at the very largest level. We've lost, for instance, most of the summer sea ice in the Arctic. The Arctic is now often an open ocean. That is causing extraordinary changes in the way the jet stream operates, since it runs on the differential in temperature between the pole and the equator. It now gets stuck in these high amplitude uh, 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 formations. Similarly, the Gulf Stream, uh, because as we've melted all that ice in the north, we've uh, put lots of fresh water into the North Atlantic and that change in density means that the great conveyor belt that runs those giant ocean uh, currents no longer functions efficiently. Even something as fundamental as the planet's hydrological cycle is completely off kilter already because warm air holds more water vapor than cold. In arid, arid, arid areas, we get more evaporation and hence more drought, and eventually it catches fire as we saw this summer. But once that water vapor is up in the atmosphere, it's gonna come down. The residence time for a molecule of water vapor in the air is only about seven days, so it comes down in wet areas and it comes down in deluge and in flood. And we see this over and over and over again. So, the largest systems on the planet are now in violent and chaotic flux. The jet stream, the Gulf Stream, it doesn't get any bigger than that. But it stands to reason, if you think about it, that the smallest systems in our world, including the systems within our bodies, would also be in flux. Obviously, our physiology is adaptable. That's why people can move from, you know, Hanoi to Edmonton and survive just fine and vice versa, but there are obvious limitations eventually on how much outside the extreme, outside the norm you can get. As that very powerful kidney stone study that I was writing about was beginning to show. So just to go quickly through it, on the health front, on the human health front, people have begun to figure out an extraordinary number of ways that this rapid warming is changing um, our experience. There is clearly a big rise in vector-borne disease because, well, basically, the creature that most likes the warm, wet world we're creating for it is the mosquito. That's why both malaria and dengue are on the rise in extraordinary ways. Foodborne disease increases as temperatures go up, as do waterborne diarrheal diseases. There are clear links to levels of violence uh, as we see temperatures rise and to changes in mental health. Allergens become longer lived and, and, and more extensive. Uh, when we begin to see what we used to call natural disasters with their after effects, these things really begin to add up. Take, for example, the flooding that I described earlier and which we have seen on and on and on this year. 
Two months ago in Libya, they had the largest rainstorm they've ever had, the kind of rainstorm you can only have on a globally warmed world. It was enough rain to wash away two dams and then crash into a major city, flushing 10,000 people out into the ocean where they drowned. The after effects of those floods are remarkable. Pakistan had the largest flood we've ever seen on this planet last year, and people are still dealing with the effects because 30 million people were moved from their homes, at least temporarily. The water is still in place. Wildfire and all that comes with it. On the East Coast this year, we finally felt what people around much of the world have been feeling for the past decade or two, breathing that remarkable smoke that came pouring out of those Canadian fires. Food security is now in question, and for the first time in our lifetimes, malnutrition is on the rise instead of on the decline around the world as it gets harder and harder to grow food. And at the most simple level, it's simply becoming too hot for people to live in many places around the planet. We're seeing temperatures and wet bulb temperatures that are beyond the ability of the human body to cope for very long. The World, Meteorolog World Meteorological Organization estimated last month that there are now about 489,000 people a year dying from extreme heat, 45% of them in Asia. I want to emphasize the brute unfairness of all of this. The iron law of global warming is the less you did to cause it, the sooner and the harder you are hit. As indeed that kidney work demonstrated by pointing out that even in this country, you can still read the effects of the redlining policies of the 1930s on the human body. There are cities where the temperature differential between the places that the federal government uh, rated A and urged people to invest in a hundred years ago where the temperature is nine or ten degrees cooler on a hot day than in the places mostly minority that they said should be avoided. That is a lot of bad news and I don't make any effort to sugarcoat it. This is by far the biggest thing that humans have ever done. Nothing comes even close to it. But the good news is that we're now at a moment when we can imagine and then begin to see an intervention that can arrest this, not stop it, it's too late to stop climate change, but perhaps stop it short of the point where it cuts civilization off at the knees. And if we have scientists to thank for the warning that we got 30 years ago, we have engineers to thank for this intervention. In the last decade, the price of renewable energy, energy from the sun and the wind and the batteries to store that energy when the sun goes down or the wind drops, the price of that has dropped about 90%. We now live on a planet, we now live on a planet where the cheapest way to produce power is to point a sheet of glass at the sun. That is a water into wine miracle that if we embraced it fully would allow us to begin to make remarkable progress. Sometime in the next 20 or 30 years there'll be other things, small modular nuclear reactors, tidal power, geothermal power, but for right now the thing that we have are solar panels and wind turbines. We have the direct power of the sun captured on those panels and we can take advantage of the fact that the sun differentially heats the earth producing the breezes that turn those turbines. <laughs> and we have the appliances to put all that electricity to use. So the electric vehicle, the electric bicycle, the heat pump for your house instead of the furnace, maybe most um, easy, the uh, induction cooktop to replace the gas flame that we have in our kitchens and that we now know from good epidemiological studies this year causes four, four, three, four, five hundred thousand cases of childhood asthma in the U.S. each year alone. Just which if you think about it makes a good deal of sense. If you have a campfire in your kitchen, which is what a gas stove is, it's giving off stuff that you do not want to breathe. 
In a larger sense, this reminds us of the medical opportunity, really a public health opportunity on a scale we've never seen before, that could come from this transition away from fossil fuel. We think that nine million deaths a year on this planet, about one death in five, are caused by breathing the combustion byproducts of fossil fuels, those particulates that lodge in lungs and create so many other problems. So the possibility of ending large-scale combustion on planet Earth for the first time in uh, 700,000 years or something is extraordinarily attractive. That combustion did well by us. It made us who we are. Darwin said that fire and language were the two things that marked humans apart. Uh, when we learned to control combustion of coal and gas and oil, it gave us modernity with the Industrial Revolution. But now the costs are too high, those nine million deaths a year and the existential crisis that is climate change. It's the moment to take full advantage of the fact that the good Lord was kind enough to hang a large ball of burning gas 93 million miles away that we now have the wit to make full use of. And if we did, not only would we save an extraordinary number of lives, we'd save a lot of money. The most important study on this came from Oxford a year ago. And it found that a rapid transition to renewable energy would save the world tens of trillions of dollars over the next decades, not because of the avoided costs of having our cities destroyed by climate change, they didn't even factor that in, simply because we would no longer have to be paying every week, every month, every year for another cargo of coal or gas or oil. That's tremendous bargain but it's a bargain that we have to seize quickly if it's going to make any difference. This is a time-limited problem. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has told us we need to cut emissions in half by 2030 if we are to have any hope of meeting the targets we set in Paris just six years ago. 2030 by my watch is six years and a month away, so we have to get to work. And oddly, that work is made both easier and harder by the fact that it's much, much cheaper to imagine doing things the right way. The reason that it makes it harder is because there is a vast industry on this planet, the fossil fuel industry, that would very much not like to, like to not change its business model. It would like to keep doing what it's doing. Um, we know now from great investigative reporting over the last five or six years by the Columbia Journalism School, the LA Times, on and on and on, that the fossil fuel industry knew everything there was to know about climate change back in the 1980s. Back when I was writing that first book, people at places like Exxon were busily investigating climate change too. They had big staffs of scientists, lots of money, and they found what scientists working for the government found. In fact, they predicted with stunning accuracy what the temperature would be by 2020 and what the effect would be. Not only did they do this, these scientists were believed. Inside Exxon, for instance, they started building all their drilling rigs higher to take, uh, to take account of the rise in sea level they knew was in the offing. What they didn't do was tell any of the rest of us Instead, they engaged in an expensive and successful 30-year effort at delay and denial and disinformation, offering, uh, often hiring many of the people who had worked previously for the tobacco industry on exactly the same task. If you want to understand big oil, think about the Sacklers. This is the same story, just on a much, much larger scale that affects everyone over all of time. Which is why, instead of simply addressing this rationally, as we could have and should have 30 years ago, we've instead had to do this somewhat crazy work of trying to build big movements around the planet to get people to take seriously chemistry and physics. Um, and that work has been mostly what I've been engaged in in recent years. I, I, I keep writing books, that's my vocation, but my 
volunteer work has been building these big movements uh, at places like 350.org, which took its odd name from what the scientists said was the most carbon we could safely have in the atmosphere, 350 parts per million a number we're already well north of. The instruments on the side of Mauna Loa in Hawaii today are registering about 420 parts per million CO2. That's why the Arctic is melting, and it's why Canada is on fire, and on and on. 350.org has organized, we think, about 20,000 demonstrations in every country on Earth except North Korea. And we've done things like block the big Keystone Pipeline and start this fossil fuel divestment movement that's become the biggest anti-corporate campaign of its kind in history. We're at about $40 trillion now in endowments and portfolios that have sold their stock in fossil fuel in an effort to weaken the power of this industry. And it's been remarkable to watch young people come to the forefront of this fight. I started 350.org with seven college students. Those divestment campaigns, which have been successful at places like Harvard and Princeton and Oxford and Cambridge and the University of California and the University of Michigan and on and on and on, those have been run by young people who went on to bring us the Green New Deal idea and hence the Inflation Reduction Act that finally put some federal money behind this transition and the same around the world. You all know the name Greta Thunberg and you should. She's one of my favorite people to work with in the world. It was an extraordinary pleasure to write her a note this June congratulating her on her graduation from high school. Think about that for a moment. Um, um, but young people, I've heard one or two too many people tell me, oh, it's up to the next generation to solve this problem. Young people, for all their energy and intelligence and idealism, lack the structural power to make change on the scale that we need in the time that we have by themselves. They need lots of backup. And the reason that I was willing to come here to talk is because scientists and doctors are among the people left in our society with some credibility, some ability to get others to step up and act. I've always felt dumb in some ways asking scientists to help with this work. I remember the first time that I asked Jim Hansen at NASA, our greatest climate scientist, to come get arrested. Um, and I remember thinking, this is just ridiculous. Why should he have to end up in handcuffs? It's clearly better for the world for him to be at his bench doing the work that's informing us about where we're headed. But in fact, in the world in which we live, it turned out to be very important for him to take that step. And now many, many, many scientists are following him down that same path. And it's been really inspiring and extremely helpful to see that happening. I'm not telling you that you need to go to jail. Um, um, I, I've been more times than I would have imagined I was going. It turns out it's not the end of the world. The end of the world is the end of the world. That's why we do this work. But I am telling you that you need to be further outside your comfort zone than you are now because the planet is way, way, way outside its comfort zone. Um, and only if we're able to get outside ours, in our role as scientists, in our role as doctors, but also in our role as citizens, that's the only chance we have to make this work. Americans often default to a kind of individual response to problems. Faced with something as big as climate change, our first instinct is to think, what should I have on my roof? What should I have in my garage? Something like that. Those are important questions. I'm happy that my roof is covered with solar panels and that they connect to an EV, but I do not try to fool myself that we are at a stage where we can solve this thing one Tesla at a time. 
What we need is for individuals to be a little less individual, to join together in these movements of the kind that we've built. The one that I've been working on these past years is for older people like me, people over the age of 60 and at third act. We've come together to get a lot of work done. So you all are in the first flush of ruddy youth, but tell your parents about the work that we're doing and get them engaged. If I can, as I close here, um, try a medical analogy. What I'm trying to say is the planet is now running a protracted fever at a level that we've never seen before. We understand at some level what the source of the infection is. It's all of that carbon from all that fossil fuel. But if we are to deal with that infection and the fever that it's causing, then we need the antibodies and immune systems of the body politic to go to work. And that is us. In this analogy, we are the only force that can rise up to make change. Otherwise, as with any system, things will carry on as they are and the outcome will be clear. Now, I want to end by saying it's clear and painfully obvious that we don't always win those fights. Sometimes people get sick and get a fever and we're not able to rally the body to its defense and they die. And there are scientists who think we have waited too long to get started here. But the best science indicates that we still have a window, albeit a narrow and fast closing one, to make real and profound change in the direction that I've described. And whether or not we do it will be largely a function of how many people rise up with how much vigor to push for the change that we so desperately need. Thank you all very much. <laughs>